Welcome everybody to another episode of Ciencia Café Paso Merced. Today we're going to talk about smell and taste. We have the pleasure to have a uh, Dr. Daniel Reed. She's a geneticist from Yale University and she works at Monell Chemical Sciences Center at Philadelphia. Thank you very much, Daniel, for accepting the interview. Absolutely my pleasure to be with you today. You work with genetics, right? And how the DNA determines how we can taste. Is that, is that right? That's exactly right. So it turns out that just like some people are colorblind, they can't see certain colors, certain people are taste blind. So they can't perceive certain kinds of bitter compounds. And also people are very different in the more pleasant senses, like in their ability to taste salt and sugar. I, I, I believe that the, the chemical perception is a very complex uh, thing to study. For example, we all in our houses, we have these machines that imitate vision, like cameras. In, even in our cell phones, we have cameras. We have even microphones that imitates how our ears work. But we don't have in our houses a, a system that can take, tell us, oh, this liquid is going to be sweet or this liquid is going to be bitter or we don't have uh, machines that tell us, oh, in that place we have this smell or not. That means that this chemical perception is so, so complex that engineers are not being able to reproduce those. Right, you make a really important point. You know, we have eyeglasses to improve our vision and we have hearing aids to improve our hearing, but we don't have anything that boosts our sense of taste. We don't have any sort of eyeglass for the tongue or hearing aid for the nose. So that's exactly true, but it's not quite true that there's no, uh, there's a, there is a engineering projects to try to recreate the human sense of taste and smell. And one of the reasons that people are trying to do this is of course, um, there's a lot of times where we don't want to taste dangerous things. So for instance, when drugs are being developed, there's things called electronic or e-tongues or e-noses that try to sense the different chemicals and, and say what the compound is. Unfortunately, these things are not very good at right now to sense the different compounds. And then there's the whole problem of how you then transmit that to humans as a sensation. Because, you know, if you think about trying to make up for this lack of Like, so if somebody can't smell very well or can't perceive taste, you want to boost that. So we haven't figured out a way to get these taste and smell sensors to then talk to the human brain. Wow. So maybe in the future, we'll have some sensors that we can connect in our phones mm -hmm. and taste. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And, you know, you get a direct path to the, to the pleasant. So, Daniel, I was watching the other day a video where you mentioned that there may be a relationship between the ability to taste, right, and mm -hmm. chronic disease. How, how come they, there's a connection between these two things that apparently are very different? Yeah, so there's sort of two big connections. So the one, first connection is pretty obvious. So if you think about it, if you can't taste food, you might have one of two responses, or if you taste poorly, which is you might overeat, you know, you're looking for something and you just can't find it, you're not satisfied, Or you might just give up, you know, it doesn't taste good and you just give up and you don't eat. So that, that's an obvious connection. But there's an interesting connection we didn't know about before, which is the taste receptors on our tongues, which are the things that sense the taste, are actually in other parts of our body. And so some of our bitter receptors are broken, so we can't taste certain bitter compounds. And when these broken receptors are in the nose, they uh, are not able to sense compounds that bacteria secrete. So the bacteria secrete things to talk to other bacteria, and some of those things that they secrete are bitter. And so the human nose listens to that bacterial chat and launches an attack when it senses the bacteria there. But the people that have the broken bitter receptors, they can't hear those bacterial signals and so they're more likely to have chronic infections. So that's an example of a taste receptor that's been repurposed to be a, like a, a spy in the nose to smell out disease. 
Now we are with Valentina Parma. Thank you, Valentina, for participating. Valentina is a research assistant professor at Temple University, and she works with human social chemosignal communication, and she aims to understand how humans connect using our sense of smell. Is that right, Valentina? That's correct, that's correct. The first question is, how come smell is strongly related with communication between humans? Yes, m many people don't even think that that's the case, right? We think we're communicating yeah. through visual signals, through audition, like voices and written text. Uh, and olfaction is kind of in the background. We know that animals do communicate through their sense of smell. Like, we may have heard the word pheromones and so on. These molecules that trigger uh, certain reactions in animals of the same species, for instance. And we wonder, like, is there the same thing in humans as well? So can we actually communicate just by uh, the older molecules? And so what I'm studying mostly is human you know, signal communication, as you said, which just means that I'm asking people to sweat usually on T-shirts or on other agents. And then I ask somebody else to smell it. So that's usually pretty disgusting, but we are understanding a lot of how we connect as humans uh, through this sense that even if we don't really pay much attention to it. And so moms and babies do connect through smell. The baby tend to look for their mother and it's the, one of the first sensory information that the baby, babies recognize about the mother. Partners tend to relate to each other also on a smell dimension. I like your odor, I don't like your odor. And then we have like precise communication through smells that goes up to transferring emotions. So I can smell your fear, I can smell if you are disgusted or if somebody is happy. I'm not good at putting labels to uh, these emotions when they are presented olfactorily, but I can start reacting and my brain will process the signals in a different way. Well, I didn't know that you can have so much information from smells. There's wow. a lot. It's a complex sense. It's very complex. So we haven't uh, figured out all the details yet, but it's a good science question and it's, it's very interesting to work on this. I bet you have a lot of uh, scientific anecdotes doing your research. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. Recently, like since three months ago, we have hearing this word in the news, anosmia, a lot. Uh, so first, I would like to ask you, uh, what is that? What is this anosmia? And this, and then we can talk about COVID-19 and anosmia. Of course, of course. Yeah, the, the sense of smell in these past few months like has become more, you know, in the minds of people. So what I said before that we don't usually pay attention to our sense, chemical senses, in reality is a little bit different during this pandemic. Anosmia is a word that comes up often uh, these days because it seems to be related to the uh, to COVID-19. It seems to be, it's one of the manifestations. And what it really means is that lack of sense of smell. So anosmia really means lack of sense of smell. And what happens in uh, some of the, the patients that have been diagnosed with COVID-19, but also in the patients that think they have COVID-19, is the sudden loss of their sense of smell. So suddenly people start not smelling the odor of the apple that they're eating. And that's quite weird. So some of the first reports that we were alerted to happened on social media with people trying to reach to us chemosensory scientists and say, oh, like suddenly I cannot smell or taste anything. And what do I do? Like, is this gonna stay forever? Is this that is just a transient symptom? And in response to that, we got together and we tried to understand a little bit better how um, this association between smell changes because it seems more varied than just smell loss at this point and uh, COVID-19 is, um, is working, like how these two things are associated. And so the first thought is, well, COVID-19 is a virus and we know that one of the main causes of anosmia, this loss of sense of smell, is a, like, is post-viral. So I have a virus, fluffy nose, I stop smelling things, that's kind of normal. We usually do not report that. We have an explanation for why we don't smell very well. But COVID-19 seems to be different in this respect. And uh, some of the patients report that their nose is perfectly open. And so they could potentially smell, but they don't smell anything when they're eating some, some fruits that they remember the smell of and they're just like, what, what's going on here? Like, this seems to be 
different from other viral illnesses in the connection between smell and the virus. And so one of the mechanism they can, that tries to explain why this happens is that there are some um, coronavirus seems to link to some um, effect how some genes are um, expressing certain proteins and this seems to be related to uh, certain cells that are in the olfactory epithelium which is really like behind this spot in the, in the nose like right behind your glasses and where the molecules bind together with these receptors. And then after that, the information goes to our brain and we have the experience of smelling something. And it seems to be that some of these cells like are um, related to the virus in a way they're particularly vulnerable to the virus. And this seems to be the cause of, again, stings. Like we, the data are still pretty uh, being out there. This is an unpublished report. But there is a hypothesis on how this mechanism could work. So coronavirus um, focuses on certain uh, cells that support the olfactory neurons. And when these cells do not work, then we kind of lose the whole experience. And so our nose is free, but still the information doesn't get to our brain. And so we report, hey, I don't smell anything, and I know I should be smelling this, this apple that I'm eating. I suppose since this is a massive uh, thing, you can potentially collect massive information from different patients all around the world. As I told you, like we were receiving these reports from uh, really from Twitter and from other social media. Uh, and we thought, okay, let's get together. We're all experts in the chemical senses and let's try to put together questions to better understand what's going on here. Uh, in a few weeks, we became more than 600 across 51 countries as of, as of today. And we grew into a group that is called the GCCR, which means the Global Consortium for Chemosensory Research. And we came together to, to try to really understand uh, what this link is. And so having members from, um, or participants at this point from 51 countries, really means that we can access like many different patients that have been diagnosed with the disease or they report to have been diagnosed or even people that at this point, they have other types of respiratory illnesses. Because as I said before, COVID-19 could be a special case of viral infection when it comes to smell loss. And we want to really understand if this is the case. So in the literature right now and in the news also, we've been hearing about smell loss and different relationship with COVID-19 but uh, we still have to have this large database that comes from many different countries, many different experiences with this, with this disorder, in you know, trying to understand exactly how to smell, but also taste and also the sensation, what we can call oral touch. So the tingling of the tongue when you, uh, when you eat a mint, a mint candy, or when you have like a spicy chili pepper that touches your tongue. So we want to understand also how the other chemical senses are affected by COVID-19 because uh, we know that usually when we smell something or eat something, these sensations are very mixed up together in our experience. And so we'll try to tease apart all these aspects. So what if somebody in Colombia who, who suffered from COVID-19 and has anosmia, for example, wants to participate and provide information that you guys can use, can they do it? Yes, yeah, so that would be actually amazing. If you know you have COVID-19, if you think you have COVID-19, or if you have like you're sniffling, you're coughing, and you don't really know what's going on, that's, uh, please take the survey and try to answer all of our questions. So we are as, we're asking people that have been having these symptoms for the past two weeks to answer, and we want to see how their smell and taste is within this uh, recent time. And if you are, don't have you know, any type of respiratory symptom, then please share the survey. You may know somebody that, needs, uh, that has the symptoms and we want to spread the word as much as we can. So in a few days, we have been able to collect, to collect more than 13,000 responses across, the, across, at this point, 12 languages. But new languages are coming up and Spanish is already out there. So 
means. Can you tell us about the Monell Chemical Census Center in Philadelphia? What is the purpose of this center? Right, so the Monell Chemical Census Center is what we call a nonprofit research institute. It's a place where people come and do pure research. And we're focused on taste and smell. And we do this in what we call a multidisciplinary way, which just means that there's every kind of scientist there. There are people that are psychologists, there are people with test tubes, there are people that study cells and people that study whole animals. So we do everything from studying whether tigers can taste sweet compounds to how cells respond to different things. So if you come, you, you know, and, and everybody that it's ever in Philadelphia, we certainly would invite them to visit us. Um, you'd learn a lot about your sense of taste and smell from many different perspectives. Thank you very much for participating in Ciencia Café Paso Merce. I really appreciate Stay it. Stay safe. Thank you. Stay safe too. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. ¿Quieres ser notificado cuando salga un video nuevo? Suscríbete a nuestro canal oprimiendo el botón rojo y después la campanita.